Welcome to uh, Directors Across Canada. Uh, my name is Catherine Middleton. I'm with the National Directors Division. And I'm based in Vancouver. Before we begin, I would like to first acknowledge the traditional Indigenous lands that we all live and gather on today. Although this meeting is online and our event takes place at many locations across Canada, we each still enjoy the pleasure of living within an Indigenous community. As a gesture of appreciation for the use of their lands, I would like to ask each of us to offer a positive thought for the local Indigenous people and a hope for their health and wellness during this time of uncertainty. Thank you. Um, I have the pleasure today of introducing Zach Lepovsky. Uh, Zach is the National Directors Division representative in British Columbia, and he is the genius behind the Just Watch Us director movement, which includes things like directors.ca and these Just Watch Us chats. So without further ado, Zach. Thank you, Catherine. Um, so while we're still waiting for a few people to join, I'm just going to talk uh, briefly about some of the other programs and things that we have going on. Um, seeing as you are incredible active members who are coming to participate in this event, I just want to make sure you're aware of all the other events that we have going on, and then we'll jump right in. Um, as you've probably gotten lots of emails, most of them from Ryan in your uh, inboxes, uh, hopefully these don't come as a surprise. Um, one of the best things we've been doing this year is the different courses that we've been running, um, the How to Direct for TV course, the How to Get Hired, Pitch and Sell course. Um, those have been wildly uh, popular. Um, you know, we bring out some veteran, veteran directors and really dive. Um, and we also have a um, new one that's coming out by Heather Hawthorne Doyle, who is one of our amazing directors in the room right now, um, that's how to direct for MOWs, um, because that's often one of the first um, amazing jobs that you get as a director to prove that you can, you've you got what it takes when someone gives you money. So look out for that. Um, I think invites going out today or, um, or Monday, um, and that's gonna be on December 5th. So save the date for December 5th for the um, how to direct MOWs workshop, which we've got some amazing directors coming out to, to help give um, information for that. Also for our BC members, we've got some members from across the country joining today, but um, I just wanted to give a quick um, list of the things that our BC members can, can take advantage of. Um, we have our some financial funds that you all have access to. The demo reel funds is there to help you pay for half the price of getting your demo reel up to date, which you can apply to um, once a year. Uh, we have the Toastmasters Fund. If you want to take classes with the Toastmasters, we'll pay for half the price of going to Toastmasters to get your public speaking and powers at full full power. Um, we also have a Carol Kirshner Fund, which allows you to um, take one-on-one -on -one, um, discussions with Carol Kirshner, who's an amazing career coach and personal coach, uh, which members do. We pay for half the price of that. Uh, a lot of people do that right before they have a big pitch or something. Um, and very exciting, very soon we're going to be relaunching the, uh, what was previously called the DGC BC Short Film Award. Um, we're relaunching that as the DGC BC Greenlight, which is basically a program to finance two short films. Um, there's $30,000 each with a bunch of other elements that come on board. And um, those, the, uh, the, that's going to open in the next few weeks and the deadline is going to be in early January to get your application in. Um, so for our BC members, that allows you to, for one director member and one non-director member, so either, you know, a PA, an AD, an LM, PM, to make a short film to take their career to the next level. Um, so start thinking about those, get your applications in uh, in January. The announcement should be going out really soon. And then, of course, directors.ca, which every director on here should hopefully have their profile on. We've got 96 directors on there, um, which currently is for BC directors only, where we um, created, it, created it, but working with CAF, Catherine and Dave and the rest of the NDD, we're excited that we're going to be expanding directors.ca across the whole country very soon um, to, a, to make it the destination for direct for people that are looking to hire directors. Um, so definitely, if you're already a BC member and you haven't applied and you're not on directors.ca, get your application into Ryan, email Ryan, bug Ryan, make sure you're up there because it's a huge resource that's been leading to people getting a lot of opportunities. Uh, and if you're somewhere else other than BC, look for that email in your in your inbox soon um, to be able to uh, send in your application to be on directors.ca. Um, awesome. So looks like we've got our room of people that have joined. 
So now I'm going to introduce the other people that are on this call, starting with uh, Dave, who's the National Executive Director um, and also actually used to work at Telefilm. So he's got some inside knowledge and then we scooped him up and brought him over to the DGC. So um, Dave, please uh, give us some words of wisdom. Thanks, Zach, uh, much appreciated. Uh, well, first, uh, um, a few thank yous, Catherine and Ryan. Thank you so much for organizing this. It, uh, it's um, going to be a great discussion. I'm, I'm looking forward to it. And um, just, just a couple quick things. And then um, I'll introduce Sam Bischoff, who does that policy for the national office. Maybe the first is just to say, um, you know, I, uh, I live in Toronto now. And uh, just this afternoon, the provincial government um, announced uh, further um, steps to um, kind of lock things down in response to what is happening right across the country, which is an uptick in in uh, in COVID and, and the pandemic. So um, I just maybe wanted to start with uh, well wishes to members uh, tuning in across the country. Um, uh, we've done, I think, um, a good job of keeping ourselves safe and keeping ourselves working. Um, one of the exceptions um, here uh, for businesses that are permitted to keep to carry on is film and TV. And I think that's largely just as in BC, the, uh, the way that the industries come together to put steps, uh, protocols in place to keep people safe, keep people healthy and, and, and allow us to continue doing, uh, doing our thing. Um, but all that said, um, now is obviously not the time to let down our guard. Uh, let's be you know, ex extra vigilant um, and for obvious reasons. So hopefully um, we're nearing the end of this thing, but it's obviously still a few months away. So uh, time to really um, you know, pay attention to that. So just wishing everyone well on that and uh, hope everyone can stay safe. Um, looking forward to a great discussion. And uh, Zach is right. I'm kind of like an ex-smoker here. I'm an ex-telefilmer. Um, um, but um, I had the pleasure of working in uh, for a number of years in the BC office and worked with Lauren. So I can say that uh, from a personal experience that she's one of the most knowledgeable and dedicated uh, people in our industry. And so we're really lucky to have her tonight. And I'm really looking forward to the discussion uh, with, with Zach. And um, she's ready for your questions. So think of stuff, uh, let's try and stump her. I think it's gonna be, it's a hard challenge but looking forward to the discussion. And um, I guess on, on that note, I'll just turn it over to uh, Sam Bishop who does policy just for uh, a couple of quick updates for things that uh, the Guild is involved with. Um, uh, spoiler alert, uh, they're rewriting the Broadcast Act. So that's an important one. And I'll leave it at that. So everyone uh, have a great discussion. Um, I look forward to seeing um, all of you tuned in at some point, you know, actually getting out and seeing each other in person again. I guess this is the next best thing. Um, so I uh, wish everyone well. And Sam, over to you. Thank you, Dave. Hi, everyone. Uh, so yeah, my name is Samuel Bischoff. I'm the Public Affairs Manager at uh, DGC National, and I'm uh, based in Montreal. So my task uh, is to cover all areas of uh, film and TV public policy for the Guild and contribute to the advocacy efforts. And you know, when we talk about advocacy, it includes research, analysis, interaction with peers and industry stakeholders. Um, and about two weeks ago, actually on November 3rd, as the Minister of Canadian Heritage, uh, Stephen Guibault, um, tabled new legislation to modernize the Broadcast Act and introduce new regulations for domestic and foreign um, streaming platforms, OTT. Uh, you, we call them OTT. And uh, uh, actually in the last few years, we've been very active, Digital National have been very active to, um, I mean, participating um, in many discussions leading to this new um, legislative, um, this new, actually new acts, new bills that is being, you know, reviewed right now. Um, and the objective of, um, of these discussions were to um, um, provide the tools to stabilize our sector over the long term and adequate find, provide adequate funding and professional opportunities for directors. Broadcasting regulation has been a critical, critical part of Canadian cultural policy for decades and regulation under the Broadcasting Act currently includes spending requirements for conventional broadcasters on Canadian programming. Online platforms such as streaming platforms, whether it's CBC Jam or Netflix, have not been regulated, meaning they don't have any form of spending or exhibition requirements. 
We believe that everyone who benefits from the system should have obligations. Each and every platform oper oper sorry, operating in Canada should contribute to the creation of Canadian programming in some way. All media entities, meaning you know, broadcasters, online platforms, um, should be included into the Canadian system and under the CRTC's jurisdictions, the Canadian media regulator, and be required uh, to contribute to Canadian accountants. Um, so yeah, we see you know, having a new system um, to be a matter of cultural sovereignty, but most importantly, to have Canadian creators to be able to continue telling their stories for the decades to come. So at, at this stage, uh, this new broadcast act, uh, as we call it, um, is that it's second reading at um, the House of Commons. So we really hope that, uh, that the next year we'll have, uh, we'll have it adopted. And, um, and, and hopefully in the, in the years to come, um, we'll, we'll feel the effect and the impact on, uh, on the industry across Canada. Awesome. Yeah, thank you, Sam. It's extremely exciting and very proud of all the work you guys have done. And it's amazing to see, you know, actual change happening within the actual, you know, laws and rules of the country to really, it's going to enable so many creators. So it's extremely exciting and you should all be super proud. So thank you, Sam and Dave. Um, and now I have the incredible privilege of introducing Lauren Davies, um, who I've known for a little while, but I was shocked to learn, Lauren, when I looked you up, that you've been working at Telephone for 22 years, uh, <laughs> which is uh, an incredible achievement. And for the last eight years, you've been the regional feature film executive of the Western region of Telephone, which I was also shocked to realize how big the Western region is. Um, it's British Columbia, Alberta, Manitoba, Saskatchewan, Northwest Territories, and the Yukon. So you cover a large territory and we have, um, people joining today from across the country in a lot of those provinces. Um, but thank you so much for coming. And, um, and I'm really excited to chat with you. Um, before we jump into the conversation, I just wanted to tell people how they can participate, which is there's two buttons at the bottom of your screen. If you're on Zoom with us, uh, there's a raise your hand button, uh, which will uh, show a little hand icon um, next to your name. Um, and that will mean that we'll bring you onto the show and you can ask your question to Lauren live in person. Um, if you're a shy person, you can click the Q&A button and write your question um, in there. And uh, I'll be keeping an eye on that. Um, I'd love for a few people to raise their hand right now just to show that it works and you know how it's, doing, how it's, how it's working. And if you do, I might bring you on the show. So be, be careful. So uh, we got a lot of people raising their hands. So. I'm going to bring a few people on, um, and uh, here we go. I'm going to bring in. Uh, we got Malibu. We've got uh, we've got a few people here. Um, just going to show you guys how it works. So turn on your cameras, um, and uh, I want you guys to briefly think of a question. Of, or not a question, but I'm hoping to hear from you guys. What is it that you're hoping to learn today? Um, maybe, uh, I don't know, Malibu, if you want to take it away, what are you hoping to learn today? Oh, I, am, am I hearable? <laughs> yeah, we can hear you. Take it away. What are you hoping to learn? Oh man, I'm hoping to learn a lot of things, but I'd, uh, I'd really like to learn what sort of the experiences of making a first feature film and, and like that's where I'm sort of at right now but I'm sort of all the experiences come together to help with that but yeah awesome well we'll definitely answer that um uh, Michelle tell me what are you hoping to learn today uh well I'm not sure if everyone's heard but telefilm just came out with some new funding guidelines and I just wanted to hear more about that yeah, it's a really exciting time at Telefilm. There's a lot of changes that are happening, um, which I'm eager to, they're still happening. So a lot of the stuff we're gonna talk about today will be um, sort of a mix of what's currently there and what could be coming down the pipe. Um, but it is a moment of transition, which is really exciting. And Don, what are you hoping to, to uh, learn about today? Uh, you're muted, Don, can't hear you. You win, you win the first mutie. Oh, there it is. Um, okay. <laughs> as Warren right, likes hi. To <laughs> um, similar to Michelle, I, hi, Michelle, we, we're, we go way back, but uh, yeah, I'd like to find out a little bit more about the low budget programs and what, what they have to offer through telephone. 
Awesome. Yeah, we're going to try and cover all the programs. So thank you, Don. So for everyone watching, that is how you raise your hand and come on the show. So please do that. We love to see, it's hard over Zoom not to see other people. So um, please do that if you can, or you can leave a question in the Q&A. But I'm going to ask some questions first to get the ball rolling. Um, so Lauren, I was curious, because I've never asked you this before. It said in your bio that you were a producer before you worked at Telefilm. So I'm curious what your life was before Telefilm. Well, excellent question. Uh, first of all, thank you. Thank you for the lovely introductions. Um, thank you so much for uh, inviting me to be at this event. I think it's fantastic. And the upside of the pandemic has meant that we can reach so many more people through Zoom and other platforms. So it's just been um, a wonderful opportunity to be able to speak to so many people. And um, Zach is correct in that I have been at Telephone for an awfully long time. And Dave, I will try to live up to your uh, lovely accolades of being knowledgeable. So we'll see how I fare on that today. Um, yes, I actually went through film school after um, a different route academically. I went through film school as a writer director and uh, got sucked into producing very quickly upon uh, leaving film school and started on a no budget first feature by uh, Bruce Sweeney of all people. Some people might remember that name, who is also a UBC film school grad um, and Lime produced that. And then went on um, to do a lot of little corporate stuff. And then before I joined Telefilm, I produced a one hour um, documentary that was for the CBC. Um, and then I came over on the funding side, uh, originally at what was now BC Film, and then to Telefilm to run the TV side of things. And eight years ago, um, as uh, Zach pointed out, I um, was asked to come back to no budget filmmaking, my roots. So that was kind of, uh, that was kind of fun, but I have uh, worked on a lot of different sides at Telefilm. So I've seen things from different sides um, and that's really been exciting for me and also gives me an opportunity to understand the industry from so many different perspectives. So um, that's, uh, keeps me keeps me there and keeps me on my toes. Yeah, and you're an incredibly passionate person about film, which is why it's great to have you there. Um, so what I thought we'd do first, and people are gonna ask lots of questions and please ask questions as we're talking about things so we can wrap them into the topics. Um, and Lauren's told me to cut her off if, uh, if I have an interesting question. <laughs> so if I, if I cut her off, that's because she asked me to. Um, but first, can you just give us a general overview of the different programs that Telefilm offers as far as sort of the the different opportunities at the different budget levels, just so that people have an idea of sort of the many different ways that you can engage. Mm -hmm. the, uh, the programs at Telefilm kind of follow the trajectory of a project, of a film. So we have a development program. We have two different production programs, which we'll get into more detail because I've already sense that there's, there, there'll be some questions there. And then there's a distribution and marketing fund. And then there's um, funds to travel to film festivals with the film. So we kind of look at all the different um, uh, phases that a project takes. And um, I thought that we'd start with just those uh, first preliminary ones, because I think that will be the most uh, interesting. Yeah. Um, well, could yeah. we maybe start with, because one that I was, that some people on here might be curious about. I know it's not something you run, but you have information about is, is the Talent to Watch program, because that is sort of where it's sort of designed to be your, your first way in uh, to making your first film. So we can give a little bit of the details of what that program is. Yes, so we have two different production programs. The one Zach's referring to is a, is a very um, different kind of program from the others that Telefilm runs. And, um, and I'll go into that detail. And the other is the main production program. And within that main production program, there are different streams that are, aren't actually uh, readily apparent when you read the guidelines. So we'll walk through that as well. As a first time director, there's really no barrier to enter to either. So you could come to the Talent to Watch, which is for quite micro budget projects. 
And you can also, if that project doesn't fit the parameters of that program, you can also come to the mainstream. There's no uh, limit um, on the how low a budget can be. Um, and so there's uh, opportunity in both programs. The Talent to Watch program is specifically for first features, but you can bring a first feature into the main program as well. We do a lot there. But the Talent to Watch program um, has been around for about five, six years now. And I really like it because we um, do a lot of films through there and it kind of is a rip the bandage, bandaid off approach to filmmaking in that rather than spending four or five years trying to raise that 900 to a million dollar budget, these budgets are very small and you just, you go do it. So the way it's structured is we have a, about 40 or 50 partner organizations. So it's a multi-phase process. And the first process is, is that you apply to one of these partner organizations. They're across the company. They're set up to try to have as low barriers of, as possible. So it includes um, organizations that have training. So it's everything from film festivals to film schools to film co-ops. If you need to be a member or alumni of one of those co-ops or festivals or schools, but you um, uh, apply first through them. And what are then, some examples of those like across the country, like in BC, I know Crazy Eights and yeah. Cineworks. Are there others that? Yeah, in school? BC, you've got um, UBC. I think Langara is there, um, the Bosa Film Institute at Cap College. Um, Cinevic, Cineworks, um, the Okanagan, uh, I believe the film society there, as well as national organization, organizations like Women in the Director's Chair, NSI, Canadian Film Centre, where you may have trained or taken a course through there that would make you eligible to apply through them. Uh, Vancouver Film Festival um, is another one, and so is Story Hive, which is a, a recent partner. Yeah, so you you kind of apply through them, and then those organizations they pick it's they pick one person, but there's multiple streams that they can pick people for, right? Isn't that right? They can choose a, um, two projects. They can choose um, just a, a regular project, and they can also choose a project from um, an in, an indigenous team for the indigenous stream. So there is a separate indigenous stream, um, and those recommendations. So Isn't there also get, a francophone stream as well? For um, well, there is a French. There's there there's an English yeah. and there's a French stream. Yes. Yeah. 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 And um, so they will make their recommendations. Some years they don't. Some years they don't find a project, that, um, or there is very little demand, and some years they're overwhelmed. Um, and so I'd encourage you to speak with um, your partner organization. Um, in advance, just have a chat on how it's working and um, what, uh, when they're going to have their intake. And then those recommendations then go to a national jury of peers, people that have uh, made uh, micro budget films in the past. And they select um, anywhere from 18 to 25 is usually the, the typical norm. I think it was a little less this year at 12. And those budgets are kind of aimed at $250,000. So Telefilm comes in for a $150,000 grant. And then the producer can, uh, that can make up 100% a, a, a of the financing, or the team may decide to um, raise more financing or have other avenues through which they can apply. Uh, to get grants and um, build that budget up. That's how it exists right now. But as um, there are changes afoot, <laughs> there are changes afoot. So I mean, that might have been something we should have said right off the top. But <laughs> telephones right now having quite um, uh, a deep consultation process with the industry. And these programs, all of our programs have been in, uh, in effect for a long time and are quite some of them quite dated 
And so um, we're having uh, everything from surveys to town halls to uh, meetings with associations. I think um, Telephone met with the DGC two days ago. Um, and that's been very enlightening and helpful and a real collaborative approach to figure out what the priorities need to be moving forward. So next year, I anticipate that there will be quite a lot of change to the programs. And so the things that we're talking about today that are very program specific, I'd encourage you to sign up on our um, homepage. If you scroll to the very bottom, there's a stay connected button and just sign up for our emails um, and industry announcements because it will kind of give you a heads up when new guidelines are launched. Yeah, I mean, probably in general, the program will stay the same, but things like the dollar amounts or the amount of people or and is, if there's a cap or not, those type of things might change. Yes, exactly. Uh, I think some of the uh, points of um, issue are that the budget is so low that it's been very challenging and difficult on the team. Um, and I would say that a lot have felt that they needed more mentoring, particularly in the area of business affairs. And so there's a lot of discussion about um, what kind of needs and what's appropriate budget level um, and how many we should be doing. And is there yeah. opportunity for development? Lots of Lots of really interesting questions. Cool, so that's talent to watch. If anyone has more questions about that, feel free to ask. Um, but then there's other production streams as well. Um, and there's sort of regional ones and then there's national ones, right? Yes, so the production, the main production guidelines, um, there are these different de decision-making streams within there that aren't readily uh, apparent. And we have, when you read them, you'll see that there's kind of this cutoff at a budget of 2.5 million. And what that means is for under 2.5 million, those projects do not have to have a distributor attached. Um, they are determined regionally. And what that means is there are four regional executives across the country. And as Zach said, you know, the West is one region and it's quite large. Then you have um, Ontario, Nunavut, you have Quebec, and you have the Atlantic Canada. So there's one of me in each of those um, in each of those regions, and so um, the this is what we call sometimes the lower budget stream. This under 2.5 million is our most oversubscribed fund at Telefilm because there really are no barriers to enter. You can be a first time director, you can be a seasoned director. So uh, to give an example, this year just in English we received 137 applications across the country. And uh, we were able to do I th about 20. So maybe 16 of those were production and four were post-production. And we can talk about how you come in for post-production as well. Um, in the Western region, we received probably the, the largest, the lion's share in terms of numbers. We had 55 applications and we were able to fund uh, six productions, one post-production. So it's super, super competitive. Um, and we have a um, rule that you can only apply with the same project twice. And so we can talk about how to um, put your best foot forward in under those kind of constraints. Yeah, something else I was asking a few directors um, sort of about what questions to ask. And one of the things that came up a few times was, at least on the West Coast, there's sort of a feeling that it's not even worth applying because the net, the money for the whole country sort of regionally gets more distributed to the East Coast than it does to the West Coast, even though the region is so big. Um, is there any hope you can give to people that have that opinion or is, is it disproportionate to the West versus the East? And if so, is that something that might be fixed or should they still apply? What are your thoughts about that? Well, 100%, yes, please apply. Um, for those of you on the, on this, uh, in this meeting that know me, you'll know that it's a, it's a huge preoccupation of mine, um, regional allocations. Um, for that under 2.5 budget stream, the, the budget, the program budget that we have to spend on that is absolutely distributed across the country 
according to population percentage with a little more uh, coming uh, to uh, Atlantic Canada and English speaking Quebec to make sure there's enough to actually make a film or two. Um, so there, it's really um, uh, even playing field and that you're not competing against each other. So it's really just that the Western projects are looked uh, um, looked at together and each region has their own allocation, their own budget. That isn't necessarily the same in the other programs. And so um, that's something that's come up. And I think that's something that we'll, we'll be trying to address in the changes that we're making. And then there's some programs whereby um, the concentration of applicants is going to be centralized, like the marketing fund, which distributors apply to. Most of the distributors are based in, in uh, Montreal and Toronto. And so you're not going to get see that even playing field. Um, but in the regional, the lower budget stream, it is there are separate regional budgets. Cool. And then um, just so people know, there's a big difference between how Telefilm participates in your film financially between the regional program and the national program, right? As far as whether it's a recoupable um, amount of money or not. Yeah, so that speaks to the level of financing that we can um, apply to each project. And in the lower budget stream, there's a cap of $500,000. And for the lower budget stream, if your budget's under 2.5, you can choose whether or not that's a contribution, which is a non-recoupable contribution or an equity investment. And um, the reason you have that choice is it will impact your tax credits. And so you can choose what is going to be more advantageous for your project. Um, we don't advise on that. We just leave the choice with, with, uh, with the client. Um, in the, on the and just to clarify, non-recoupable means you don't have to pay it back. <laughs> <laughs> Just so that people get that clear. Yeah. The, the 500,000 comes in and if you make 500,000 selling the movie, you don't have to give that to Telefilm in the lower budget regional section. Correct. If you choose the, the non-recoupable option. Yeah. The, um, if you have a budget over 2.5 million, then it is necessarily an equity investment and Telefilm is looking to recoup from that because they have uh, more money at risk. And the recoupment, uh, just to talk about that, that is what that means is when your project actually makes a sale, then Telefilm gets a portion of that as would any of your other financiers that have um, an equity stake or um, you know, profit participation. And that money that we recoup is actually a really important part of our financing uh, other projects going forward. So that and revenue then, is crucial, yeah. Yeah, The um, you told me once, and I just think it's interesting that is there, is there a sort of creative difference between the types of projects that might go for the lower budget? Are they evaluated creatively differently um, for the types of projects that would go for the below two and a half million compared to the ones that go to the above two and a half million? Like, um, are they evaluated on different, you know, elements? No, not necessarily. There are definitely different decision makers. And we are looking for projects that are going to break through the noise and break through the amount of content out there and get noticed. Um, but you're right in that when the budget is bigger and we have an equity stake, there are expectations on um, on commercial on commercial success, and that's why there's necessarily needs to be a distributor attached. We're going to look very carefully at um, that distributor's marketing plan that they're going to do right by the film and, and get it out there and support the the promotion for um, attracting audiences. On the lower budget stream we're still looking for the same type of films, films that will have critical success. Um, obviously, any um, applicant wants to have commercial success. Um, 
but we're really looking to find those projects that are going to create buzz around that filmmaker and get them noticed. So it's a, it's a, it's a lot of focus on visibility at that point. And then um, I'm curious, sort of, we've just talked about three different application, you know, pathways. There's sort of the talent to watch, the lower budget regional funding and the national funding. Is there, and you've been at Telfem a long time, are there things that come to mind in those applications themselves, sort of best practices and worst practices, like the things that people have done that have really helped them through that process? And, and if it's different between the different streams and things people have done that have really not helped them, obviously you don't have to be specific to people, but just what are, what are the best examples of things people have done and, the, and things that people should avoid? One of the interesting things about Telefilm is when you apply to us in production, we can be first in. So in that lower budget stream, that's why there aren't any barriers to enter. We can be the first ones that come onto your project. Um, but because of our, our fiscal constraints in terms of how our cash flow works, we need to uh, make sure that we contract with you in a certain time period and that the contract means that the financing is, is closed. So this kind of gives this um, shape to our cyclical year. In the lower budget stream, because the demand is so huge, uh, we have one deadline a year and everything is compared to each other. So it's, it's a real comparative process and we're choosing those strong projects. So I would say um, the things to, that would make a project not go very far is if you came in with asking us to be first in, which is absolutely fine. Um, but if you were at a $2.5 million budget, asking us for 500,000 and the rest is TBA with no idea where it's going to come, then we'll know that that's a really high risk of you closing your financing. If you don't know where you're gonna get another 1.5 million, um, you know, there'll be tax credits for sure in that financing structure, but um, if there's no plan, then it'll be an issue of timing. And we might say, we don't think you're ready, come back next year when you have a little more pieces of the puzzle. It's perfectly fine to have a plan where you have, nothing's been confirmed, but at least we know, okay, there's an application in at Manitoba Film and Music, and there's an application in, um, to whatever fund and we're in negotiation with some private investors and we're doing a crowd raising campaign or whatever. So that's the one thing you want to have in mind. I would say on the creative side, you want to make sure that you have a production ready screenplay. So we dive pretty heavily into the script, um, the director's vision, the director's past work, um, and so you want to have put some thought into that and you wouldn't want to rush in a first draft because we'll quickly pick up that, oh, this is maybe a draft or two away and you're not going to have time. And again, it's, it's about, um, you don't necessarily have to go to camera in that same fiscal year, but we need to know that that, pro that, that project is production ready. And if you think about the kind of competition and the numbers that we were talking about, you know that there's your competition is going to have spent a lot of time working on those elements. And so whatever you can do to be as production ready as possible, given that there is only one deadline a year, and that's, a, I know, really difficult for people, but that's, I would say, in the lower budget are, are the things that you'd want to make sure that you have um, feel confident with. And just so people are aware, because it's sort of the reason we're doing this talk now, it, when is that yearly deadline that generally, where does it generally land? It is generally a window, a little period of time that uh, it typically in, goes from uh, sometime in March to some the end of April. So it's uh, you kind of gear up for making that application in early spring. Um, given the volume, sometimes it's very difficult to um, uh, get all the ducks lined up if we're the first in to be able to close and um, close your financing and then go to camera in the summer. 
So we see a lot of winter shoots, or sometimes you can actually, um, you know, delay uh, production into what we, we would consider our next fiscal into the next spring summer. So there is some flexibility there. Yeah, so just so everyone's hearing that loud and clear, it is currently November. In March slash April, the window to apply to the lower budget below two and a half million regional funding opens for a sliver of time, at which point it closes for another 12 months. <laughs> so, right. so if you're thinking of making an indie film, uh, keep that in mind as far as what you're doing over the winter break um, and that you're kind of getting those those pieces together. And, and just to add to what Lauren was saying, the um, first money in is a, is a huge deal because you can have lots of people that want to support you and your rich uncle and whatever, but often they don't want to be the first person to, to put money in. No one wants to sort of, they're always scared of being the first fool because like no one else has done it. But when you can talk to people and say, if telefilm comes in for half a million, will you come in for a hundred thousand or, or whatever? And they feel a lot better about the idea that there's sort of this um, entity that's coming in as the first piece that sort of anchors all the other parts of your, your funding. Um, so I want to get into the other streams, but we haven't had very many questions. So anyone, please raise your hand. We just talked about three different ways you can get money to make a movie. I'm sure people have questions about um, those three streams. And then we're going to move into talking about the, the development and distribution and marketing and film festival side of it. Um, so just to add a few people here, we're going to add um, Don. Uh, I saw someone else raise their hand and then they put their hand down. So. Please don't be shy, please raise your hand. This is why you're here. Um, but uh, Don's on the show again. Uh, you're, you're, not, you're, not, you're not a first time caller, you're a second time caller. No, um, and I'm not muted this time. <laughs> um, all right, and I'm gonna bring in April as well, but Don, what's your question? Uh, my question is, if someone is chosen by one of the few that gets chosen for the low budget program, how long does it take to actually get the money from the time that the decision is made? Yeah, it's a great, great question. And hi, Don. I know, I know your name. Hi, hi, <laughs> nice to see you. Yeah, the um, the the kind of um, timeline is that decisions get made in the summer, and then it the ball. And what happens if the, if it's a positive decision is that you get a commitment letter, and the commitment letter says this money is reserved for you once you meet all of these conditions, and you get this long list of conditions. But the big one is closed financing. So what happens is you get that commitment letter and that is, you know, speaks to what Zach was saying about now I can go to other financiers or other funders that are waiting for maybe a certain level of financing to be in place. And you can say, okay, telephones in for this much. But what happens is we can't go to contract and make that money yours until the financing is closed. Mm -hmm. So that sometimes dictates um, how things, how the timeline goes. So we usually give a, a few months and then there's expiry date. And if the expiry date comes up and, and the project is, um, you know, it's too far away or you weren't successful in raising the, the, the financing that you had hoped for, we may not be able to continue on. If you do raise the finance and you close the budget, uh, sorry, close the financing and we go to contract, then we are able to um, start releasing money per a drawdown schedule, which is usually in four different amounts. One will be on the signing of the agreement, which helps you with pre-production money. Then, uh, and then the last comes uh, when the finish, uh, the pro the, you're finished and you can supply us with a cost report. So it kind of follows some key milestones of your project. Um, so typically it's, we can go to contract and start flowing money is based on how quickly we can go to contract and how quickly we go to contract is how quickly you can close the financing. Okay, thanks so much. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Uh, April, what's your question? Uh, hi, Lauren. Um, hey. I just had a question. I was hoping you could clarify and it's been a while since I looked at the Talent to Watch program guidelines. Um, and I, under I understand the um, partner organization um, component, um, but I'm just wanted to clarify um, if you needed on top of the partnership with the organizations, um, if there, if a previous film needed to have been um, screened at 
a festival that is recognized by telefilm. I just had been on a Zoom with a indie filmmaker who said that they weren't eligible for talent to watch because they didn't have a film in XYZ uh, festival. And I was just wanted some clarification around that. Yeah, hi April, nice to see you again. Um, <laughs> there's, uh, so what, what April's speaking to is what are the minimum eligibility requirements? And so you apply to the Talent to Watch um, stream with a team, a writer, director, and a producer. And each of those people um, have to be a first time in that role, except right now with the section of producers where you can have uh, made other low budget or micro budget film. And there is a requirement for minimum eligibility of having made, I believe, two short films and uh, that have been screened at a festival. And if you look in the annex, there's a really long comprehensive list of festivals. So um, this is just to ensure that the, um, you know, the creative team has some experience going into doing a feature project because the, we really want everyone to succeed. Um, it, if you are actually looking um, to that program and you have the team has some two short films, but they're screened at a festival that isn't on that list, then you can't contact us and we'll, we'll see because there can always be room for flexibility. Thank you. Um, thank you. Um, all right, I don't know how to pronounce your name. I'm very embarrassed, but Mwite, Mwite, uh, tell me how you pronounce your name. I'll unmute it as I say it. You got it the first time. <laughs> awesome. Uh, um, nice to meet you. Uh, what's your question? Um, it's just a quick short one here. Does production heavy include a desired season or climatic conditions if it already passed when you've been approved? Or you have to Sorry, go for another question. Does production ready include um, the desired seasonal season or climatic conditions for your theme? Or do you have to, if it has passed, if you've been approved? Oh, so in terms of like when you want to shoot, like when production makes sense for your content? Yeah, so it's like a year after approval. Yeah. Um, could you wait that long? Um, you, you can, but we do have some flexibility on that. And for that very reason, so that's a really good point. When people, we get, uh, if you get a decision, um, let's say in August, and it's not time for you to ramp up and you have to shoot in summer, then there's flexibility for you, for us to still come in and contract, but that you shoot the following summer. So there, is that, is that, am I answering your question? Yeah. yeah totally. Yeah, yeah, so sometimes that's really, it's a hard timing um, in terms of, you know, sometimes financing is contingent on cast, but cast availability on a low budget feature might be difficult to do until you're really close to production. And so it is a little bit of a, a, a puzzle and we know that. And so we're trying to be as flexible as possible. And if you're not sure sometimes, should I be applying at this date or should I be waiting a year? You can always just call me up and we can have that, that conversation. Thanks. Awesome. And I apologize Thank for the light. <laughs> no worries. You look great. Yeah. <laughs> Better than mine. Um, Michelle, what's your question? Hey, Lauren. Uh, so my question is about co-pros between Canada and other countries. And I'd love to hear if there are any restrictions with Talent to Watch or regional regarding co-pros. Oh, that's a great question. Um, Lauren, can you first explain what a copro is just for some of the yeah. people who might not be sure? So uh, 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 international treaty co-production, sometimes they copro for short, but that is meaning a, um, there we have treaties, Canada has treaties with other countries. And if you meet the requirements of those treaties, it means that each country will consider that project as a domestic project, meaning that they can apply for um, any uh, government subsidies or program funding that is available on both sides. So for instance, if you're putting together um, a project that has some themes that you think would be interesting for people in Ireland, uh, and you seek out a co-producing partner in Ireland, 
you work out what the financing would be between two each country and then you can apply both to the Irish Film, Film Board and to Telefilm for funding. So Michelle's question, hi Michelle, nice to see you again, is you know, how does that work in the different streams? There's no barriers to international co-productions because we do can treat them just like a domestic production. Typically, we don't see a lot of low, bu low budget international co-productions. I've seen maybe two in the last eight years in the West, simply because they have a whole other administrative layer that can be um, costly, but you can absolutely bring them in. Um, they typically go through the national stream and um, sometimes even lower budget films will, as a co-production, will go to the national stream. Um, but there's no reason you can't bring them into any stream. It's just sometimes cost prohibitive to do so. Awesome. Yeah, and sometimes it can be complicated just getting the points to balance out because both countries have a lot of requirements of like, okay, you need one actor from this country, one actor from this country, and you've got the director from this country, which means the production designer has to be from this country, but it means you got to fly them to this country, and then the editor is going to be in that country, and it can it can get complicated. So definitely, it's a, it's an advanced level producing. Um, and speaking of producing, there was a question about, and it's something I'm curious about, which of the which of the streams, and maybe also include the development stream require a producer like as a filmmaker if, if we just have writer directors listening can they apply to these things or do they have to apply as the producer of their own project or do they have to get a producer before they apply can they apply as just a writer director themselves and then bring a producer on later and i'm sure that's probably different depending on the different streams and if they don't have a producer one of the questions was does telefilm help find producers Oh, all good questions. Um, we, the, the entity that actually applies to Telefilm is a production company. And um, the role of the producer can uh, be different people at different stages. Um, we, when you come in for production, we do want to see a producer. And it's not that you can't be a producer. In fact, you can as a writer director, but we know that we want you to focus on the art of making that film. And we don't want to be calling you on set to ask about your cash flow um, and your tax credit calculations. So we do want to see that even if you're one of the producers, you have other producers, you have a producing team around you. So we don't have to have a single producer. In fact, in the lower budget stream, particularly in, in Vancouver, I'll see sometimes five producers. So it might have been the director producer that has shepherded the project to a certain stage. And then they're gonna bring on someone whose specialty is cash flow and tax credit calculations. Someone else who might have really good relationships with um, distributors and broadcasters. Someone else who's really good at putting a low budget um, non, you know, uh, indie team together. So um, you might bring on producers that have different expertise and you can decide what kind of relationship they have. They might, um, they might have equity in the production company. They might be a uh, fee for hire. So it's really up to um, the team. We see every different kind of configuration. Um, it's the same in development. And in development, uh, oftentimes, again, we're looking at a production company. And sometimes it is a writer, director, producer wearing all three hats. We do want someone that has the producing label because that expertise in producing is what will help move that project forward in terms of um, finding partners, financial partners. Um, and so that's why that team, even if our focus on the creative is looking at the writer and the director, we want to know that there's a producer there to help facilitate the business affairs side of things. Yeah, it's to give you guys confidence that, you know, because you have to pick so few projects that this one is not going to fall apart <laughs> logistically. And you don't <laughs> um, much on your shoulders. Yeah. yeah, exactly. I've been there. I've produced a movie that I was directing and it's not fun to be doing 
insurance certificates while you're trying to do character motivations. Um, Brian, uh, welcome to the show. Uh, let us know your question. Uh, yeah, it looks like I, I have, um, I'm planning to apply in that window that we were talking about before. And um, I'm just wondering, uh, I, I, it looks like I have the next couple of months to uh, begin uh, kind of revamping some, some older things that I have already done some work on. And I'm wondering if you can speak to a little bit of uh, the, the impact of uh, genre on application outcomes. Um, if, if, that, if there's kind of any trends that, that you've seen um, that you can, that may help guide my, uh, where I put my, my energy. Yeah, good, good question. I had uh, a call about that was from someone from Alberta today. Um, so the, uh, we love all genres, bring it all in. What we're looking for though, is if you've got a project in a specific genre, we want to, we, we're looking for the projects in that genre that are going to um, break through and be visible. Um, and uh, we don't, yeah, there, there's nothing that does not work. We love everything. <laughs> so bring us the horror, bring us the, uh, of the rom-com, bring us the drama. It really doesn't matter. What we're looking for though, is that it is again, um, you know, a very polished draft and that there's something about it that you, um, and that you would know, like if you've got a, a lot of projects, um, you know, I always ask, which one are you most passionate about? Because that's usually the one that people are most excited about. Um, and I, I always find that really telling when they, someone says, these are the, you know, the five projects that I've been developing. Um, but this is the one I'm really dying to tell. And there's usually a reason for that. And there's usually something special about it. Um, and what makes it special to you is probably really what will make it special to an audience and that they'll find it. So um, again, um, if you're doing a, a soft rom-com, you know, that's, that's hard. That's hard to find um, because it's hard to get into festivals. It's, it's hard to get theatrical without, you know, marquee um, talent. So what about it? Where's, what is the hook? Like, how will it get, um, how will it stand out? And that's um, what we're trying to do is, is really find, um, it's really about visibility. So the content itself, you know, we, we want to see critical acclaim for the filmmaker um, and to, to have that success um, and have that attention means it's got to cut through the noise out there. So and that's, yeah, great advice for whether it's telefilm or not, <laughs> whatever you're the most passionate about and make sure that it's going to stand out because uh, there's a lot of people trying to make stuff. Mm -hmm. Any you. other follow up, Brian, is that again? No, that, that answered it. Thank you. Cool. One thing I was also curious about before we dive into development, uh, Lauren, was if you can talk a bit about sort of CanCon and also sort of if, you know, obviously you're under the ministry of it, you know, heritage. <laughs> um, is there any sort of Canadiana element to the decision process? And can you also sort of explain what, what CanCon is um, in sort of the more logistical side mm -hmm. of things? Because the project does have to be CanCon to, to apply. Yeah, so CanCon means Canadian content and it is actually very technical. So if you go to the um, CABCO website, it will tell you what CanCon is and what you need. And, um, and it's really about Canadian uh, control and advantaging um, Canadian um, talent. So the kind of the, the two big hurdles that uh, people really need to, to know right off the bat is it means a 75% Canadian spend minimum, and it means it tells them a minimum eight out of 10 content points. And these content points are attributed to key creative personnel. So your writer, director, first lead, second lead, um, uh, music composer, production designer, editor. 
And so uh, a telefilm, we need to have eight out of 10 content points. So it gives you a couple of extra points if you want to bring in, um, you know, a, a foreign DP or a, um, uh, uh, an American uh, performer. So um, that's what um, CanCon means. And there are a few beyond just the eight points. So there are a few restrictions. Like it, it ha one of the two top actors has to be Canadian, and either the director or writer has to be Canadian. There's a few of those types of restrictions. Yes, thank you. Very important points. Thank you, Zach. <laughs> Very important. So at Telefilm, you know, it, we do need a Canadian writer or director, um, and um, but we don't restrict the type of content that you're writing. It's Canadian by virtue of it coming from a Canadian uh, director and a Canadian writer. Um, what we do sometimes get uh, a little uncomfortable with is if it is completely um, tailored to a U.S. audience. So this is, uh, you know, government funding that comes from Canadian taxpayers, and we want it to um, be first and foremost for Canadian audiences, and then we hope that that is going to be a, uh, uh, audiences around the world. When something is, um, you know, set in Texas, about Texas, um, uh, and it's a Texas story, then we have to question: Well, why isn't the funding coming from the the states um, as opposed to Canada? But it really, there really is no no restrictions. You do not need to have a beaver and a mountie or a maple leaf in the film at all. So. Um, and um, we today was asking a question: Does permanent residency count as as Canadian in, as far as those calculations? Um, it's a really good question. Um, yes, but there are some restrictions. Um, so I believe um, there are the restrictions come when it comes to um, Canadian control of a company, but there aren't restrictions when it's about CanCon points. So a uh, permanent resident status would be equivalent to a uh, citizen status for those CanCon points, but ownership of a company is, is a bit different. Yeah, so the, the company has been majority owned by Canadian uh, citizens. So that's an important element when you're thinking about producers that you're bringing on or forming a company with. Yes, um, um, and just to, to go a little bit down there because it was something that came up a lot in our new development stream for racialized persons. The permanent resident status um, is fine for Canadian control up until a certain time. So you have an, a number of years by which you have to have, uh, within which you have to have applied for Canadian citizenship. And so that is very um, difficult. Uh, it is very com complicated, I should say, not difficult, but it's very complicated. Um, so if you have questions around that, I would, I would encourage you to call one of our offices and talk to the program coordinators that can walk you through um, what that means. And then um, there was one question. You said the seventy-five percent of the spend had to be in Canada, but that, that does that number change when it's a co-production? Because um, obviously, yeah. if the other country says seventy-five percent, you're kind of absolutely messed and up. Absolutely, and if you are thinking of shooting um, partially outside of Canada, just go to those CAPCO guidelines to understand what the Canadian cost means. Because if you're traveling Canadians, Canadian citizens two different countries to shoot, but let's say you're taking a camera crew, um, their travel and living expenses, for instance, outside of Canada um, may still be considered a Canadian cost. They attach themselves to the citizen. So you just make sure that you understand what Canadian costs are because um, oftentimes when you think, oh, I'm not gonna be eligible, you, you really are going to be. Awesome. Um, Kim, are you there, Kim? Uh, we yeah, brought I'm you here. onto the show. Hopefully you're available. Uh, awesome. What's your question? So my question actually now I have two. So one of the questions was in terms of, hi, Lauren, thank you, hi. by the way, for all this. It's been really helpful. Um, and you too, Zach, thanks. Um, one of the questions was in terms of uh, submissions, you talked about the 2.5 um, budget 
the window was like March, April. Is that the same for the 2.5 plus? That's a really good question. So no, there are, there are no deadlines on the bigger budget films. And that's simply because the demand is less and that in turn is due to the fact that they're much more complicated to put together. So those are ongoing. Um, so they're, they're open until, uh, you know, all the money has been spent, which is typically late summer, I would say. Um, uh, and sometimes a little later than that. So I would still, if you're thinking of bringing in a project for that bigger budget stream, I would still aim to um, think about the spring as a time to bring it in. Um, but there really isn't uh, a deadline. Per se. Okay, great. Unless, and unless the other question. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. And the other question sort of picks up on your idea, like so, you know, Canadian content. If you're, let's say, you're doing a period film, um, and it takes place in Germany, and you're you're planning to shoot most of it here, but then maybe five days in Europe. But um, is there the same feeling around a project like that that's shot, you know, that's supposed to be Europe as there is for like the U.S. sort of Texas? Uh, I feel bad picking on Texas because I have family there, but um, <laughs> um, who are probably going to get mad at me. Um, um, no, not no, not so much. Um, I I wouldn't worry too much. And if you are concerned, that's when to call the executive in your region and just to give them a heads up. And if you're putting together those bigger budget um, projects, you know by January or February, you should reach out to the national executives. And right now that's um, Stephanie Azam for the English market and Marie-France Gorbeau for the, the French market. Sorry, did I just say English? English for Stephanie, French for Marie-France. And um, you give them a heads up. You say, you know, this is the, the film I'm gonna bring in. Um, because you will have to have a distributor attached, you can say, you know, I've got, I'm, I'm reaching out to these distributors, I've been in discussion with them, or there's interest that I'm getting from these distributors. They might ask you, what sort of cast are you looking at? Um, but you would have those preliminary discussions, so it's on their radar that you're bringing it in. And then if there's any concerns about the content or um, the questions about the partners, you can have that conversation. So even though there's deadlines and, and you're submitting an application, always reach out to um, your uh, regional or your national um, you know, uh, represent, representative. And I can always facilitate those conversations as well and introductions. So if um, you know, I typically speak with everyone in the region, whether or not they're doing, uh, no matter what the budget level is, if it's talent to watch through to national, and um, we can have those preliminary talks too, and then I can, you know, connect you with Stephanie. So that's what I'm here for, um, because sometimes it's hard to get on her radar because she's trying to cover the whole country. Um, but those are the kind of conversations that you want to have. We also have two fantastic content analysts and um, one of them reads everything that comes in nationally. And they will also have questions on the content. And, um, and it's great to have them have a conversation with them as well, or just a heads up, this is coming in and this is what it looks like. Um, we don't pre-read scripts, but we can definitely look at a synopsis, kind of get a sense of your financing plan um, and give you feedback as to um, you know, what we know, seeing a, a breadth of projects um, about where the stream that you're trying to um, access or just the marketplace that you're looking at. Yeah, you would be shocked how many people, Lauren, I tell to just call Lauren. <laughs> it's, like, it's like, I'm like, if you were, I, I frame it to them this way. If you're making a movie and you were hoping to work with a studio, would you reach out to that studio and try and get meetings with those executives and try and pitch those executives and, and hear what they're thinking and, and develop that relationship? Do the same thing with telefilm. There's people there that um, can, that want to help you and are passionate about film. Don't treat them as a, as a granting board that's faceless, that you put your piece of paper through the slot and cross your fingers. That it's a group of people there, and, and they're a huge resource. And I would, I was, oh sorry, yeah, go ahead. Uh, and I would say to that too. I mean, one of the things that we kind of got 
partway to this year, and I think we'll um, get uh, more of the way there next year, if not all the way, is that we'll be moving to more of a jury process um, for, uh, for these decisions. Um, Talent to Watch is already a jury. Theatrical Docs is a jury. Regional takes, uh, we use a myriad of outside readers and internal readers, um, and we use a portfolio approach. Um, but we'll be moving more and more to a jury process. And even though we don't know who those people will be on the jury, you can still reach out to me for, um, to talk through how to best position your project. So that's what I'm here for. Awesome. Thank you very much, Lauren. That was really helpful. Thank you. Welcome. Thank you, Kim. Um, why don't we talk briefly just about what you were just talking about, Lauren, which is um, sort of the, the changes that might be coming. Um, I also, there's two, a few other topics I want to touch on before we run out of time, but um, are there any sort of, obviously it's still in progress and it's still changing. Um, the jury system is something that the DGC has been campaigning for quite vigorously uh, that, you know, putting sort of uh, creatives back at the, into the focal point there and having alumni and, and people, you know, evaluating the, the creative, um, not just the, the, the um, producer track record, but are there other um, elements that you think um, could be likely in the future of telefilm that you're able to talk about? Well, we'll, we'll try to see if we can um, kill two birds with one stone uh, <laughs> and talk about a bit about development. Yeah. So our development program, um, we had to consolidate, um, uh, trying to reduce our men. We consolidated a lot of uh, very traditional programs into a very untraditional program uh, many years ago. And that has created a lot of barriers to enter. And that was what Zach's uh, referring to of a producer's track record. So ironically, development was harder to access than production. There were more barriers to enter in development than there was in production. Um, and so we are in the midst of a huge consultation on how to reimagine our development program, keep um, some of the really good aspects of it, um, but change it up so that it is more accessible. Um, and that, program right now, I won't speak too much to it because I think it is really going to change. Um, we're, we just closed our doors to it for this year, so it's going to not reopen probably until next, uh, I would say, summer. Um, and uh, that uh, will, there's four streams that I will talk about. There's four streams right now, and one is an automatic stream that um, does depend solely on a producer's track record. There's a selective stream which gets um, a kind of an in internal selection committee that uh, tries to rebalance after the automatic stream is done. And then there is a stream for indigenous projects. And this year uh, we launched a new stream for uh, members of racialized groups, which has been um, wildly successful in terms of the demand. Um, and that's the, both the indigenous and stream and the stream for members of the racialized group, both those streams are done by uh, juries. So um, that's the development program. And so uh, what is, being talked about is um, how that automatic stream should be determined and what kind of funding should go between the automatic and selective streams. Um, now I've forgotten the other question that I was going to, oh yeah, juries, uh, decision making. Yeah. And so in production, you know, Talent to Watch is already a jury. Um, I think the, the other streams will go more to a jury and what that jury makeup looks like is hard to figure out right now and that's kind of what we're looking at because to run that many juries um, a year we will run out of people that can sit on them without conflict <laughs> so mm -hmm. it's uh yeah it's, it'll be a, a really exciting challenge but one that um uh we, we're gonna have to tackle and uh i know the dgc has been um you know, a real proponent of that change. And I, I think it's really exciting. And I should just, you know, tell the people on the call how 
incredibly grateful we are to have Zach and Dave Forget being uh, being voices in that consultation has been really helpful and informative, and I think a really great part of that um, collaboration. We've got some uh, uh, smart smart guys there helping us out. <laughs> um, and then in terms of other changes, so the that producer track record is a subsection of what we call the success index. And the success index was created by a way of trying to measure telefilm success and also the success of a film. And so that's under discussion what the components should be for that. Right now it's it's trying to measure um, commercial in success, industrial success, and cultural success, and it's uh, in a quantifiable way. Um, so that's one of the things under review. The development program is under review, and the talent to watch program is under review. And we're looking at uh, you know how best to structure the processes under uh, the production main program as well. And um, as far as those changes, is there a sense of when those changes will be applied? Like, is, are they going to be coming into effect next year or the year after, or, or what's the we're hoping like? We're hoping next year, yeah. Awesome, well, that's very exciting. Mm -hmm. um, I know I'm very excited about <laughs> a lot of the sort of institutional issues that came out of a, a system that was built with good intentions, but it sort of created, um, like you said, a lot of institutional barriers that um, even the success index itself, in my opinion, which is a, a fairly evil construct, showed that it was being less and less successful over time. Um, and so, and as we know, the success that, how to measure success is becoming increasingly difficult because of the uh, box office, you know, gross isn't really the measure that really makes sense anymore. Um, so we've got just a few more minutes, but I do want to kind of rattle off lots of other people's questions. Um, one quick question was Pat had a question about is there sort of a maximum limit to funding um, or in you, you mentioned the 500,000 for the um, for the regional section. Can you just quickly um, give an idea of what the maximums are? Yeah, it, um, the talent to watch is 150 at the moment and that can make up any percentage of your financing. So it can be 100%. You can do it solely on our cash or you can bring other financing to it. In the production program, um, under 2.5, there's a cap, a lesser of 49% or 500,000. Um, in the past, um, you know, people would come in requesting much lower than that. Um, and as other sources of financing in the marketplace have dried up, I've seen it, the demand creeping up and up and up um, towards that cap. Um, and on the national side right now, I believe it's 3.5 million is the cap or 49%. Awesome. Um, and is there an incentive to asking for less? Like, are you more likely to get it if you ask for less? I never, I want you to ask for what you need. That is the most important <laughs> because we don't want you to uh, be underfunded or not be able to close your financing. So always ask for what you need. But certainly we see all sorts of requests because things can come in with $500,000 budgets, in which case the 49% the of just under 250,000 will be the cap. And sometimes people um, have the, you know, a uh, $2 million budget and will be closer to that $500,000 cap. So just ask what you, what you actually need. Um, can we accommodate more films if there's a smaller request? Yes, but that is not uh, a driving factor of our portfolio. It's really about we're going to choose the strongest projects and we want to be there for what they what they really need. Awesome. Now, I want to touch on the two other programs that you guys have, the distribution marketing and the film festival. Can you um, give us an idea of what those are and, and at what stage you apply and how you're eligible and, and what kind of moolah you get out of it? <laughs> yeah, um, absolutely. Before I do that, I just remembered something that uh, I wanted to touch upon, which sure. is when you were talking about the deadlines and that there's this little window to apply for the lower budget stream, oftentimes that does not work for people. And you might get momentum on a film because uh, you've 
there's a crew that's free um, because they're on hiatus or there's a performer you want to work with that, that just happens to have time off right now. Um, or you've got um, your financing in place and you don't want to wait. And so it's very often uh, that productions will um, go into production at their own risk, of course, um, and get to a rough cut stage. At, in that same intake period, you can come into us with a rough cut and ask for completion funding, which means we only look at we look at the rough cut and your post production budget. So that's another way point of entry for people that um, if you have that kind of momentum and you go into production before applying to telefilm, there's an opportunity to actually apply to telefilm with a rough cut. We look at it in even the if, same pot. And, and you can even if you, I believe you'll consider it even if you denied production funding when, yes. you know, if they uh, yeah. applied early, you know, in the previous March, didn't get production funding, made it anyway. And then it's the next March you can apply for, for finishing funds. Yep. And we've definitely funded those. <laughs> like there has been some that at, at the production stage, uh, you know, we felt um, the vision wasn't really coming through. And then they were able to say, here's the rough cut, you know, it, 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 and we go, oh. That's fantastic. <laughs> they get to say, I told you so. Exactly. And you know what? We love I told you so. So that means you've gone and had success. So that we love those. Um, the other programs it's actually referring to is there's a uh, marketing and distribution program. And that can be for we prioritize telephone fund, funded projects, but you can bring in projects as well that um, we didn't fund. And um, that the applicant for that needs to be whoever is controlling the distribution rights. So that could be either the producer or it could be the distributor. Most often it's the distributor that comes in. And that fund is to support a theatrical release. So we will come in up to 75% of eligible P&A costs, print and advertising costs, um, uh, on uh, projects that um, are reviewed favorably and that's to help with theatrical release. And the question will be, what does that mean now during COVID? Um, and what does that uh, mean when distributors aren't releasing theatrically? Um, right now, because there's a lag and there's still a lot of content, a lot of projects that um, have uh, contracts for theatrical releases. Um, you know, we're, we're, we're grappling with that right now on, on what the kind of how flexible we can be. Um, and uh, going forward, it will be interesting. I mean, that'll be something that we'll have to take a look at for next year when we open up is what is the definition of a theatrical release? Um, yeah. So th yeah, that's that program. And then there's an cool. international marketing and festival participation program. It's got those, it's probably the longest title of anything you'll see at Telefilm. And that is for um, travel to festivals. Um, so the typically, depending on what festival, there's different tiers and each tier gets kind of a lump sum amount to travel your director to a participating um, festival for a premiere. Which can be good. I've noticed a direct correlation between winning awards at a festival and your attendance at the festival. <laughs> there seems there seems to be something that happens to the jury when you're in the room. Uh, so I do recommend going if you can. Um, a few quick questions in the last uh, five minutes that we have. Both Mustafa and Wite were asking if are there just more clarity on what the um, are there inclusivity initiatives? Are there specific streams for racialized groups or, or you know, LGBTQ or, or gender disparity? What are, you know, what are the opportunities for people that are in um, underrepresented groups? Yeah, so there is a specific stream in development. There's not a specific stream in the production programs, but it is a high priority. So you will see in the, the language and the guidelines are for projects of equal quality, um, priority will always be given to projects that reflect diversity, either of region, gender, or underrepresented groups. Um, if you look at the press releases of the um, projects that were selected in Talent to Watch and in Regional, um, you'll see it's it's very um, very much a priority for us and the 
uh, the diversity that we're having in those programs is, I, th I think, wonderful. Um, we don't have set targets like we do in gender. Gender, there is a parity target, meaning that we are aiming for um, parity in the key creative roles, which is a very interesting topic <laughs> um, that we could have a whole other session on. Um, but um, the right now, there isn't a set target, and that's something that's being discussed in the industry uh, and there's a lot of um, uh, it's kind of harder to nail down um, on what that uh, the pros and cons of that and so we do at telephone we have uh, an, an internal diversity and inclusion um, committee but we also have an external committee um, and our leads on that are um, Kathleen um, Bourget and EJ Alon and they work with a working group um, of, of industry representatives to help us um, figure out those parameters. Um, so it's very much a priority for our executive director and our, um, and our uh, board. And so it's something that, um, you know, if you want to join that conversation, by all means, you know, send me a note and I will pass that on to um, our committee um, heads. Awesome. Well, we've got the last few minutes. We're going to do a lightning round. Jeremy, what's your quick question? We lost Jeremy. We got him back. Yeah, sorry. Disappeared for a minute there. Um, <clears throat> sorry, I'll just put my camera on. Hi, Lauren. Hey, Jeremy. Um, just want to ask a quick question about, actually two, I guess. I don't know if you mentioned it in the development program on the French stream. Is that a jury system or is that Telefilm handles it internally. In development. Um, development. Yeah, right now it's it's internal with kind of an internal selection committee. Um, the French is handled out of our Quebec office. Um, it's a really good question. I don't know what that's going to look like going forward. So um, feel free, Jeremy, to circle back. Uh, when we start to, uh, you know, in the next fiscal, when we start to get those new development guidelines open, because it's a really good question about how French outside Quebec is handled. Yeah. Okay. And then my other quick question was the jury system that's coming in um, in the new year, will that be exclusively like a jury of creatives or will it be a mix of creatives and telefilm? And would it be blind juries or are they seeing sort of the full teams just out of curiosity such excellent questions and that's what we're grappling with right now so we don't know yet i thought it might be yeah. early for that yeah question. yeah <laughs> you're, you're, but you've you've nailed the, the the right question um and we don't have the answers to that yet but we will and that will be absolutely um published so that people know no problem thanks awesome thanks thanks, thanks jeremy <laughs> yeah well that's why we like bringing people out so that um, you can see everyone. Um, one last question from, uh, I think appropriately from Anthony Shim, who as I believe is one of the people making a, a telefilm movie uh, right now. He had a quick question about um, if you've had funding in the regionally, can you also then apply for finishing funds or is once you get funding, is that your one stream? Yeah, that's an excellent question. That comes up a lot. Um, it is just one stream. So when you come to the production program, we're looking at the financing and the production budget, which the production budget includes your A, B, C, and D categories. So it includes your post-production budget. So it's really uh, the post-production is for things that we weren't involved in in production. Awesome. Uh, well, we've run out of time. So anyone who uh, didn't get your question asked, Lauren, how can they uh, reach out to Telefilm and get their questions answered? Uh, at a later date. Um, please do reach out for all your questions because I don't want to leave anything unanswered <laughs> and we are here. So um, uh, I'm a, the great contact and you can reach me. All of our email addresses are the same. It's lauren.davis at telefilm.ca. So you can reach out to me if you have questions about decision making processes, your, you know, how to position your project. Um, policies, if you have questions, like you're putting your project together and you have questions about 
what does this document mean? And what is this for? And how do I get a dialogue account? And what does that mean? Uh, which is our kind of uh, electronic um, uh, application process and, and uh, communication process, then you want to contact the a coordinator. And our program coordinators uh, will have way more information than me. And their names and contacts are at the bottom of each web page for the fund that you want to apply to. So if you have a question on, you know, what format does my budget need to be in? Um, what does this community engagement plan mean? Um, those are questions, or how do I get the dialogue account? Um, contact our coordinators, they're super, super helpful, and we'll take all the time you need to straighten that out. Awesome, well, thank you so much for your time, Lauren. This has been massively helpful for all the members and, and a few non-members who are watching. Um, and uh, it's really exciting to hear that, you know, Telefilm is changing for what I believe to be the, the much better and, and putting creatives at the forefront in a much bigger way, and um, which is very, very exciting. So I'm sure you're excited to be a part of that change um, as well. Okay. Um, so thank you so much. And uh, I, I, I posted Lauren's email into the, into the chat. So um, if you want to reach out to her, feel free. Um, and that window is approaching it's in march april to get your um your film get that first money in to start making your your indie feature dreams come true it can happen to you um okay thank you so much and uh everyone else please if you have any questions about any of the dgc stuff that's going on you can always reach out to ryan lino directors at dgcbc.com uh he is your master of ceremonies for every event um everything that's going on, directors.ca, all that stuff. So never uh, never hesitate to reach out to Ryan. He's a huge resource. Um, thank you so much and have a very safe evening. Thank you everyone, goodbye. Thank you so much, bye-bye.